times. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter number 6 tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And um, we are going to look at a subject that is admittedly difficult to tackle. Hard to uh, comprehend, hard for a preacher to, to, to uh, comprehensively speak about. So I'll tell you at the, at the very beginning of this that I will not cover everything that is to be covered on the subject we're going to talk about tonight because I cannot do that successfully. But you know, really, if we would be honest and if most of us preachers would be honest, what subject in the Bible is there that we could adi- adequately explain or expound upon, right? Someone told me one time, they said understanding the grace of God is a lot like trying to hug a mountain. <laughs> you know, you just can't quite get your arms around the whole thing. And I feel that way every time I come to the pulpit. And um, because there's so much to it, the depths of the riches of the goodness of God uh, are, um, you know, we just can't mine out everything that's there. But I tell you what we can do, we can bring our shovel tonight and we can, we can start digging, amen? And tonight we're going to talk about real Christianity Sometimes is a call to suffering. This message tonight, uh, a call to suffering is what I've entitled it. It's uh, one of three messages in a series that I sometimes do called Real Christianity. The first message in this uh, series is a call to service. And how many of you would agree that real Christianity is a call to serve God. Amen? Amen. Uh, God has left us here for a reason and a purpose, and that is primarily so we can serve God. Real Christianity also, you find out in in, uh, chapter 6 and chapter 7, is a call to separation. Sometimes God calls us as we grow closer in our walk with God. Sometimes God takes people out of our lives, takes things out of our lives. Sometimes God will take habits out of our lives or whatever it is. So sometimes Christianity is a call to separate from some things. I'm glad tonight that God took me where he found me and how he found me. But over the last 25 years, he hadn't left me how he found me. Amen? I'm thankful for that. But have you ever thought that Christianity also sometimes is a call to suffering? A call to suffering. We're going to look at at suffering and specifically how it relates to, uh, to us as Bible-believing Christians who love God and whom God loves us. You know, uh, a couple things I want to say at the outset uh, as introduction is that uh, suffering is not always punishment. A lot of people uh, immediately think that if anything goes wrong in their life, or if anything hurts, so to speak, that God must be upset with me. And if that's how you view suffering or, or pain in this life, and if that's how you, we view God, more importantly, then we have a very a misguided view of God, number one, and of the world, number two. Suffering is not always punishment. Can it be? Oh yes, it can be. 
Is it always? Oh, no. It's not always punishment from God. Also, uh, suffering is not painless. Hence the term suffering. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you is pain really hurts. Disappointment is really disappointing. Difficulties are really difficult. Now you may look at what someone is going through and say, oh, that's nothing. But you're not standing in their shoes. And you're not sitting in their seat. And and I'm glad that God knows what by the grace of God I can handle and what by the grace of God each one of us can handle. But but suffering is not painless. One of the greatest keys for us as God's children to know about suffering is that suffering is not permanent. It's not permanent. The child of God has hope in God, number one, on this side of heaven. And the ultimate hope in God for eternity. There are people who seemingly never, uh, suffering is never over for them. But we have to remember that that is only for a little while, in light of all eternity. And there's coming a day when every tear will be dried. Say amen. Every ache and every pain will cease in our bodies. Every sorrow will be gone. Every heartache will be healed by the amazing power of being present with our God in that city called heaven. I am glad that suffering is not permanent. Real Christianity is loving God, loving our others, and serving both. I love the slogan or the the, the motto that our church has. Suffering of course, is it can be multifaceted, right? There is emotional suffering, which is very real if it's your emotions. There is, of course, physical suffering. And probably, if you're at least over 40, you, you know something about some kind of physical suffering, probably. And some in this room know a lot about that. There's mental suffering. Even what we could call spiritual suffering. Suffering is multifaceted. But have you ever thought that suffering equips the saints of God for ministry? Think about that for a minute. We're still in the introduction. Suffering, like like nothing else, has a way of equipping God's people for ministry. Our ministry that I'm in charge of is the homeless ministry. It's called Unsheltered International. And on our board of directors, we have two men who spent time homeless. One of them was homeless for a span off and on of about four years, living in his truck, living in a tent, suffering with addiction, suffering uh, uh, without addiction, uh, working but coming home to a tent. Uh, One of them was homeless for a several week period time in his life. He actually ate out of a, uh, a, a dumpster behind the circus, what he said to me was called the Circus Circus Casino in Las Vegas, Nevada. He would eat out of the dumpster morning and evening because he was homeless on the streets 
of uh, uh, Las Vegas. Uh, both of them men, God saved them, changed their life. Um, one is now a pastor. One is now a successful businessman. And they're on our board of directors for our ministry. And nobody can, can, can speak to the, to the folks we minister to quite like them two can. Because they're suffering in that arena God stirred it all up and worked it together for His good and their suffering in their past has now equipped them for the ministry God has put them into. Suffering also is a battleground. It's a battleground. And the battle is over our souls. You see, Satan wants to take our suffering... And use it to accuse our God. Well, if God really was good, He wouldn't... If God really loved you, He wouldn't... If God... And you know how the story goes. And so Satan wants to use it in one way, but God wants to use our suffering in a very different way. And we'll get into that in the body of the message. But, but understand this, suffering is a battleground. And the battle is for our very souls. When you come to the Bible, in my estimation, our Lord Jesus Christ is the greatest example that the Scripture gives us of suffering. Uh, There's plenty of examples in the Bible, but in my estimation, nobody suffered more than Christ. And, And in my mind, it's not only because of what He went through on the cross, but because... He went through what He went through unjustly. Preacher Malcolm says this a lot. I don't know if you have ever picked up on it, but uh, he says this. Jesus not only died for us, but Jesus died instead of us. Therefore, everything that Jesus endured, He endured that instead of me having to endure it. And here's the kicker. I'm the one that deserved it. You say, preacher, why is there suffering in the world? I don't pretend to give you a big, giant theological answer to that. But I will tell you this, because of sin. When sin entered the world, the Bible tells us in the book of Romans, death came by sin. And anywhere death is found, suffering is found. It's important to know God is not the author of suffering. If you want to accuse somebody, let's accuse the right one. And the right one is Satan, and the right reason is sin. Everything that's broken in our world is broken because we live in a sin-cursed, fallen world. Christ, in Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 6, Listen to what it says about Jesus and his sufferings. It says, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. In Isaiah 53, the Bible says he is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows 
and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. In other words, before we ever carry the first sorrow in this life, we have to remember, Jesus has carried them first. Amen? The Bible goes on to say in Hebrews 13 and verse 12, Wherefore Jesus also, that He might sanctify the people with His own blood, suffered without the gate. Outside of the city of Jerusalem, where thieves were crucified, Jesus suffered so that you and I might make it through our suffering. My goodness. The Bible says in 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Suffering is real and Jesus endured His fair share. Or his unfair share, as you might say it. Tonight, while I'm preaching this, there's a widow somewhere suffering in isolation. There's a single mom somewhere suffering under the heavy load that she carries now alone. There's an elderly person in a nursing home that's suffering tonight. There's orphans all over our world who have have not only suffered the loss of their parents, but never knew them. The sick are suffering with their pain. The caretaker suffers as they work day and night to care for the one they love. The pastor suffers as he tries week after week to lead wayward sheep that makes him sick in his heart and spirit. And suffering is all around. It seems like right now, everybody we know, I guarantee you everybody in this room knows somebody right now that probably has COVID or or just, just had COVID. And it's scary and people are suffering. I want you to know that although we cannot comprehend it, although we cannot fully explain these things, I do think God gives us scriptures so that we can better understand why suffering comes. And we can better understand that by looking at at three aspects of suffering. Why would a child of God be called to suffer? Why would God let that happen? Why would that be a part of life? Well, let me share with you aspect number one. We'll read the verses as we go, I reckon. Number one, I want you to see what suffering proves. What suffering proves. Uh, chapter 6, verses, uh, basically verses uh, uh, 4 down through 13 is our, the whole text for this message. And the first thing I want to show you is that suffering proves our identity. It, it can really reveal or prove who we really are. So on Sunday, I believe it was, preacher uh, Malcolm was preaching about the wheat and the tares, right? He was preaching about real Christians, people who are saved, and people without oil. People who are not real, as far as real Christians. They, they may look real, they may talk real, they may really sit beside us, but... But, but, but they're not 
genuine in, in their faith. They really have no real faith in God. And it's amazing that suffering has a way of revealing the true identity of God's people. In 2 Corinthians chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up till, till chapter 6, one of the biggest things that the Apostle Paul, who's the writer, one of the biggest things that he's addressing is actually the fact that he is a real, genuine apostle. There were those at, uh, at Corinth that accused him uh, of ulterior motives. There were those that, 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 had, that leveled all kind of accusations at the Apostle Paul, and, and he was telling them who he was. He was letting them know that he was God's man, and he had the evidence to prove it. You see, the fact that he was a true apostle was evident by the stripes on his back. The fact that he was a true apostle was evident by the many times he had been persecuted and imprisoned, not for stealing. It wasn't grand larceny. It wasn't for uh, all these other things that you and I would know of that people go to prison for. He was in prison several times for the cause of Christ. And so as he begins to, 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 to tell them one last time in chapter 6, he says in verse 3, giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, here's the suffering, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments. Sounds like suffering to me. How about you? And so what Paul is trying to get across here in the context of, of, of this book and also this chapter is, I am a true blue apostle and the fact that I did not sell out when the going got tough is the proof I'm presenting to you. Are you following me there? Say amen. amen. Suffering will prove our identity. And can I tell you something? that suffering in the form of persecution has already reached our shores. And the tidal wave of that persecution is, is growing stronger and stronger by the weak in America. And as that suffering comes into the lives of God's children... It'll prove one of two things. Either, either it will prove our identity as a child of God, or it will prove our identity as an imposter. Why is that, preacher? Because the imposters will not stand in the faith when tough times come. They just don't. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1, Paul said, Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or need we as some others epistles of accommodation to you? Or letters of accommodation uh, 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 from you? In other words, all the way back in chapter uh, uh, 3 of this book, he's, he's arguing the fact, hey, do, do we need proof? Do we need more proof than the fact that we've suffered all these things in Jesus' name? And I would say with the Apostle Paul, no. He needs no more proof. 
we can understand he was a child of God by the suffering he endured. Uh, suffering proves our identity, but there's something else that suffering proves, and that is our agenda. Our agenda. What Paul was telling them is, so to speak, he's telling them, I'm not here for a paycheck. You didn't hire me. I'm not for sale and I can't be bought is exactly what he was telling them. In matter of fact, in verse 11, he says, Oh, ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you. Our heart is enlarged. Ye are not straightened in us, but we are straightened, or but ye are straightened in, in your own bowels. Let me break that down for you. We love you, Corinthians. We've opened ourselves to you. We've laid ourselves open and said, here we are. We embrace you. We love you. We give our lives for you. But you've not done the same to us, is what he's saying. He's imploring them not to have any other agenda other than to love God enough to receive Him as an apostle that He really is. And He's telling them, that is my agenda. He's saying, I didn't come here for a job. <laughs> I came here because I love you. Let me promise you something. I don't care how big or bad somebody in this room may, may think you are. You back Malcolm Carter in a corner and threaten to take away his paycheck if he quits preaching what he preaches. See what happens Sunday. <laughs> you can't scare him with a paycheck. Would it cause suffering in his life? Yeah, obviously. But he can't be bought. That's the kind of pastor I want. And that's what Paul's saying. He says, our suffering proves our agenda. And I want to encourage you tonight, church. Think about suffering like this. And I'm just giving us some, some different angles to think about suffering. Has suffering proved anything in your life? You see, some of you are suffering in pain, physical pain, right now. It hurts you to sit in that chair. It hurt you to walk from your car into this building. There's, there's some people, did you, 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 you in, in those that are real healthy, you've, maybe you've never thought about that. But there's people in this building right now, and on Sunday there will be people. It took great effort for them to get dressed and get here. And, it, and they have to get to their seat real quick just to relieve the pain. And Sunday after Sunday, a lot of them are the ones you'll see with tears and a lifted hand. And you know what it's proven? It's proving the agenda in their heart. They want to worship God with God's people even if it hurts. Suffering proves some things. And man, there's a lot more to, to be said there, but, but I need to move on. Let's look at number two. Not only, not only do we talk about what suffering proves... Let's look at what suffering produces. What suffering produces. In verses 9 and 10, th th these are some pretty awesome verses. I guess you could just open up your Bible blindly and point your finger wherever and then say, these are some pretty awesome verses. <laughs> Preacher Brown that was uh, one of one of my biggest mentors and one of Pastor Malcolm's biggest mentors, sometimes he would be preaching and he'd start his sermon. He would say, open your Bible anywhere. It's all good. <laughs> he'd say, I believe it from cover to cover. I even believe the maps are inspired, you know. Uh, it, it's all good. But, but these verses here are pretty awesome. 
I want you to look at verse 9. It says, as unknown and yet well known. He's talking about himself, the apostle Paul and, and, and the other apostles. He says, we're unknown. <laughs> we're nobody. Yet well known. As dying and behold, we live. As chastened and not killed. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. As having nothing, and yet possessing all things. I think Paul was saying, I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who will save anybody. I mean, it's like a, 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 it's almost like if you didn't know better, looking from the outside in, he was a walking contradiction. He's like, I'm sorrowful, yet I'm rejoicing. We're being killed, but we ain't dead yet. <laughs> we ain't got nothing. He says, but, but we possess all things. Amen. What does suffering produce? Well, I think, first of all, it produces power for the saint. How could Paul really sit there and write and tell us and communicate to us that he's, he's been beaten, he's been in prison, he, he's been shipwrecked, He's had all these things, 39 stripes, save one, because the one more would have killed him. And yet still be like this. Still have that positive side. I think because there is power. The power of God that presents itself in the lives of suffering saints. I'm not saying it's explainable. I'm saying it's unexplainable. I'm not saying you can put your finger on it. I'm saying you can't put your finger on it. A while back, somebody was criticizing me about helping the homeless. And they shook their finger in my face and they said this. They said, boy, you get on rose-colored glasses. And what he was, the point he was getting across is, you don't know that all them people, they don't want to help themselves and they don't want nothing but blah, blah, you know. He said, boy, you get on rose-colored glasses. If you think you're going to make a difference. And I thought, <laughs> wow, it's actually worse than what you think. <laughs> it's way worse than rose colored glasses. I'm actually wearing biblically colored glasses. <laughs> you know, the world says give somebody a buck when you see them. Let them get a drink or something. The world says, you know, maybe, maybe send them good vibes, good thoughts, and hopefully they'll get better. That's rose-colored glasses. Biblically colored lenses, God actually says, love them. Pray for them that persecute you. And despitefully use you. Uh, give to them. Be a blessing to them. Expect them to hate you. <laughs> and, and so the more I thought about it, rose-colored glasses would make my job a lot easier. God's asking me to forgive people. He's asking me to love them like Jesus loves them. <laughs> it's actually a lot harder than what my critics think. 
I don't know where I got that from. <laughs> but, but what I'm trying to tell you is suffering has a way of producing power in the saint of God's life like nothing else does. There's no amount of studying you can do that, 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 would, that, that has the potential of producing the same grace in your life as when you suffer and still love God. I'll get it. I'm getting ahead of myself, but let me give you 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 9. The Bible says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Did you get that? That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Why? Because of grace in their life. Because of the unseen hand in their life. Because of power. You know something that's tragic? I, I see this as a tragedy. We as believers, we as the church, it's like we've gotten so, I don't even know how to explain it, so used to the, the ways of the world or secular means and things like that, that, that we've lost the awe of the mystery of God. We want to be able to explain everything. But you know what our best explanation is? God. How do you think Moses felt, William? When God said, hey Moses, I want you to go over there to Pharaoh in Egypt and, and you know, just tell him, let my people go. That's about all the instructions he had. What you reckon them three million Jews had to say on the way out? Uh, where are we going to eat? Uh, God ain't told me yet. I don't know. Well, what are we going to drink? God ain't told me yet. I don't know. How do you think old brother Moses felt about that? What about Abraham. When God told him, hey, leave your homeland, leave everything that's familiar, and you pack up and take off to a land that I'll show you later. He didn't even have nothing to put in his GPS. Best explanation he could give anybody he saw along the way is, I don't know, God told me to go. Well, where are you going? I... I, I God just said, go. He'd show me later. <laughs> Sounds kind of crazy, right? What's crazier is that we try to use worldly, secular means and methods to pinpoint God in our life. Can't do it. God won't fit into that cage. God won't be boxed in. God says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not toward thine own understanding. But in all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy paths. Why am I suffering? I don't know. I don't know, but I do know this. If you'll trust God, and if I will trust God in my suffering, oh my goodness, it will produce power. For the saint. Number two, it will produce glory for the Savior. Let me tell you something. Uh, something interesting. And you go in your time, you look through the scriptures. Go to Hebrews, he, Hebrews 11 and look in there and read that as you have time. God's people have always been willing to suffer so that Christ could be glorified. God's people, 
throughout the centuries have always been willing to suffer in order that Christ could be glorified in them. You know in one place in Hebrews 11, it talks about saints that were sawn, S-A-W-N, sawn asunder. Why? Why would they not uh, retract their faith? I mean, all we got to do is just unconfess. Because they were willing to suffer so that God could be glorified. Why were those uh, uh, Hebrew young men that preachers been preaching about on Wednesdays, why were they willing to say, but if not, O king, our God is able. Because God's people have always been willing to suffer so that Christ could be glorified. And on and on and on, that's where the power in the church has come from. So, suffering produces Uh, 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 what did I say? Power for the saint and glory for the Savior. Look at 2 Corinthians 4, verse 10 through 12. The Bible says, Always bearing about in the body of the, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. But life in you. 1 Peter 4.12 says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial that is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice. Inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the Spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part He's evil spoken of, but on your part He is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. I don't think God could have put it any plainer in the Scriptures than that. Believers in Christ... God put some... Now, I'm not saying... Now, I, I gave you this disclaimer in the introduction. It, it does hurt. It is painful. It, I don't want to sign up for suffering. There's no list in the foyer for that. If there was, it, we wouldn't sign it, right? But when suffering inevitably comes, the Christian... The Christian <laughs> endures it Because they hope and pray that God gets glory out of it. Tonight, right now, I have an evangelist friend who I've known over 20 years, my exact same age. And last week, they took a nine-pound tumor off of his wife, uh, out of his wife's uh, stomach area. They removed her ovaries and at the same time a nine pound tumor. tumor. And right now they're awaiting the pathology reports. And it doesn't look good, obviously. And they're suffering. They have a 19 year old, 20 year old young daughter. 21 year old young daughter. and, And I'm sure she's overwhelmed with thoughts about what if It's the worst for mama. A week and a half ago, a young lady who's been friends of our family for 10 years or more lost a month-long battle with, with COVID. Her husband survived. She didn't make it out of the hospital. She left behind three daughters and a husband my age. 
And tonight, those, those, those teenage daughters are suffering because they've lost a mama. And we have seen in both of them situations the, the survivors and, and the family members praising God. How does that happen? I can't tell you how. All I know is this. When we suffer, God gives grace. God gives grace. When we suffer and cling to God, we show the world there really is something greater. And He has a name. Jesus. If you're suffering tonight, I want to encourage you, cling to God. The suffering may not end till heaven. I don't know. But as you cling to God in that suffering, there's non-believers watching you and they're taking note. There's believers watching you and they're taking note. There's someone coming behind you and they feel like their personal pain will crush them to the point that, that they're ready to take their own life. But then they looked at you in your suffering and they saw you praising God and you giving God glory. And that's how they made it another hour. Which is a good point. There's more to remember in our suffering than ourselves. There's people watching. Let me ask you this question. Are you willing to allow God to bring glory to Himself through your life? That's an easy answer when things are good. It's, a, it's a, another animal to chew on when we're suffering. Let me give you the third one. We've seen what suffering proves and what suffering produces. Let's take a moment and look at what suffering promises. Aren't you glad for the promises in the Bible? Amen. Anybody know anywhere else you can go and find promises that, that won't be broken? No, me neither. <laughs> What does suffering promise? Two things. I believe suffering promises a special relationship and a sweet reward. Those are the two things for you to write down. A special relationship and a sweet reward. In other words, never are we closer to God than when we suffer in His name. Now, I have to go ahead and tell you this. If you're lost... And, and, and happen to be playing church, pretending, if, if you're a tear among the wheat, then I don't have a promise for you here. I don't want to be mean or ugly, but th this is for God's people. A special relationship. Never are we closer to God than when we suffer in His name. How many of you have known somebody maybe on their deathbed and you saw peace like you'd never seen before and you couldn't figure it out? And they couldn't explain it. They were in no shape to explain it. But they were experiencing peace and grace. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 5. That verse says, For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. The word aboundeth means to overflow. <laughs> so as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, as we're persecuted more, as we're suffering more as Christians, the Bible says, so our consolation, which means comfort, also aboundeth by Christ. In other words, the more suffering that comes, the more grace comes. The more tragedy comes, the more grace comes. And tragedy can never trump grace. 
And suffering can never outdo grace. The grace of God is greater than any human suffering. How do you know that? Oh, death, where is thy victory? Oh, oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? The worst of it is death and the sting has been pulled away. Jesus conquered that and that's the worst. Our light affliction that is but for a moment. God's got you. He's got you. He's got you. Acts 5 and 41, the Bible said about the early church uh, 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 preachers, it says, and they departed from the council after they'd been cussed, beaten, and ran out of town. They departed from the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. <laughs> Here they got cussed out and kicked out. And they rejoiced because they were worthy enough to suffer shame for the name of Jesus. How's that work? Pretty special relationship. Acts 13:52. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. But you go read back from about Acts 13 verse 40 down to 52. And you'll find out they were expelled. The devout and honorable women got stirred up. And they got kicked out. And what happened? The disciples got filled with the Holy Ghost. And they rejoiced. Why? Because they found their relationship with Jesus went to another level. Amen? And then a sweet reward. Suffering promises a sweet reward. Look at Romans 8, 18. The Bible says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. My goodness. Revelation 2.10 says, Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Suffering promises a sweet reward. Hold on, child of God. The morning is coming. I have a preacher friend in Florida. And he uh, worked a, he was a, uh, worked in a sawmill. And he was a Christian and called to preach, but really wasn't doing everything that he should. And he got to praying for a few weeks that God would draw him closer. Lord, draw me closer to you. And he got his arm stuck in a saw. Or maybe in the gear mechanism of a, of, a, of a big sawmill saw. And it all but cut it off. If you look at his arm today, all down his left arm, I think it is, or maybe it's his right one, ginormous scar. He said it was the most painful thing of his life. And he said it's also the one event in his life that drawed him closer to God than anything else did. He said all he could think during that time was, oh Jesus. Matter of fact, he told me he knew Jesus allowed it to happen because nothing else was getting his attention. I remember one time I was overseas in Asia and I was riding my motorcycle about 60 kilometers uh, per hour. I mean, I'm, I was just six, no, 80, 80. And, and I'm booking it down the road. I was going to get some hamburger buns. I had to go to five different stores because you just, they don't have Dollar General in Asia yet. And a dude pulled out in front of me on a tricycle. And as I was going down, unconsciously, the first thing I said was, Help me, Jesus. And, and he did. And it hurt. And 
but, but, but it drew me closer. And each one of us has things we suffer with. Mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually. And I want to challenge you tonight. Just pray, God, would you use this to draw me closer? Remember the Apostle Paul? What did he have in his side or in his flesh? A thorn. How many times did he pray for, for Jesus to take it away? Was it removed? Never was. What did he say? My, what? My grace is sufficient for thee. And folks, I want you to know, and I need to know, God's grace is sufficient in our suffering. Let's encourage one another, amen? And help one another make it another mile.